So The Legend of Zelda games used to be very well known for their dungeons and puzzles within them, especially the 3D games. But in 2017, Breath of the Wild released, which became the first Zelda game to not really have a focus on them, instead being more worried with crafting a huge and engaging open world to explore. It does have a couple of dungeons in the form of Divine Beasts, but they really aren't anything like traditional Zelda dungeons. It's kinda hard to explain without wasting too much time, but basically they don't have the same design philosophy, and they don't scratch that same itch, you know? So instead, the developers made a whole lot of mini dungeons called Shrines, which are scattered across the previously mentioned open world, and these kinda replace the need for Breath of the Wild to have traditional dungeons. They usually house puzzles that are focused around one specific ability or theme, and your goal was to get to the end to where you'd be rewarded with an important collectible. Because they were generally pretty short, the developers put a whopping 120 of them in the game, which was bumped to 132 with DLC later down the line. Six years later, the game's sequel, Tears of the Kingdom, releases, which does have more traditional dungeons, so you'd be right to assume this game doesn't have shrines, but surprisingly they brought them back. And not only that, but Tears of the Kingdom has 152 of them right out the gate, which is 32 more than Breath of the Wild did at launch. Because Link in Tears of the Kingdom has an entirely different set of abilities than he did in Breath of the Wild, not to mention the completely new central mechanic of this game, that being the ability to build pretty much anything you can imagine, the shrines are very different this time around, and everyone online agrees that all 152 of them are amazingly designed and a ton of fun, right? Right? Yeah, okay, so because there's such a huge amount of them, they obviously aren't all winners, and they fluctuate a lot in overall quality, Way more so than in Breath of the Wild, if you ask me. And because there are so many with varying levels of enjoyment, I decided it would be fun to play through all of them while recording footage and taking notes, so that I can rank every single one from worst to best. And that's what we'll be doing in this two-part video series. Yeah, I'd love to do all of them in one video, but with how much I can ramble on about any given subject, I was kind of forced to split this into two parts to avoid this project taking 19 years to finish. Anyways, let's lay down some ground rules and clear up some questions you might have, because you might already be thinking to yourself, what about Roru's Blessing Shrines? These are shrines that are just a straight shot to the end and don't have a challenge in them at all, but instead the challenge is getting to the shrines themselves, so the puzzles are actually outside of them, and this can include finding a green crystal and bringing it to a certain location, fighting an overworld mini boss that's guarding one of those crystals, or solving some kind of puzzle that's just simply not in the shrine. So for Blessing Shrines, we're not just simply going to ignore all of them, but instead we'll be judging them on what you have to do to get inside of them, since that's the whole point of those shrines. Getting into actual rules, the main one is that I won't be using any materials collected outside of the shrine, because otherwise you can just cheese almost all of them by just putting a bomb or a rocket on your shield, skipping the entire puzzles. And it's not really fair to judge them when doing that in my eyes. Also, this rule obviously doesn't apply to weapons, shields, bows, and arrows. You kinda always need those. This means that all shrines will be ranked solely on their design, and their intended way to clear them. Every single shrine in the game that requires specific materials provides them in the shrine, so it's not like any of them are unbeatable because of this rule. We'll also be taking every bonus chest into consideration. These are chests that just give you some goodies like gems or weapons, and you almost always need to solve some kind of mini puzzle within the shrine to get them. It doesn't matter what's inside the chest at all, but they're a part of the shrine that can really add to the overall experience. A good bonus chest can stand out and make the shrine more memorable because the puzzle to get them is well designed, while a bad one is just kind of a letdown. It doesn't ruin the shrine if the bonus chest sucks. Every single shrine has at least one of these, and if you get all of them, it'll actually be marked on your map with a little chest icon next to the shrine's name, in case you didn't know that. This video is actually inspired by my buddy Odyssey Central's video, where he ranks every single moon in Super Mario Odyssey. It's a great video and I recommend you give it a watch if you like Mario Odyssey. I'll link it in the description. This video being inspired by an Odyssey Central video is also extremely ironic, because guess what I saw in my sub box while working on this video? Yeah, he uh, he also made a Tears of the Kingdom shrine ranking of his own. He mentioned my shrine ranking video in his video because he also saw that I was working on it, so I feel like I have to do the same thing here. It obviously doesn't bug me that he made a shrine ranking before me, I mean it's not exactly an original idea. But if you've watched that video, you'll know that his ranking is more so based on his experience going through every shrine for the first time, whereas my ranking comes from my second time going through them all, as I wanted to judge every shrine solely on their design and developer intended ways of clearing them, rather than my own personal experience with them. And besides, since I'm ripping him off now, that means we're even. Okay, that was a joke. I love you, Odyssey Central.
Want to know something else his feeder didn't have? A sponsor! That's right, I'm gonna take a quick moment to talk about Battle Crush. This is an upcoming battle royale with a top-down view where you play with up to 30 players online to try and be the last one standing as the ground collapses from under you, which you can also use to your advantage by knocking players off the map as it shrinks, and you can either go at it alone or with a team of 3 against 9 other teams. There are 15 unique characters that all play differently and are all inspired by a different god from mythologies. You got the mainstays like Hercules, Medusa, Hades, and more. And personally, I really like their design and how animated they are. Yeah, I know where you're looking at, creep. Like I said, this game isn't out yet and is slated to release in spring of 2024, but a closed beta test is happening very soon after this feeder goes up, from the 23rd to the 30th of October, and will even be available on Nintendo Switch as well. So go check out the link in the description to not only apply for the beta test, but also to receive 1000 crystals. I don't know what they do. Again, the game isn't out yet, but I'm sure it'll be something good. Thanks again to Battle Crush for supporting the channel today, and now let's get on with the video. Alright, with that all said and done, let's finally get to ranking every single shrine in Tears of the Kingdom from worst to best. And obviously this is going to have major spoilers, including on some things that have nothing to do with shrines really, like dungeons, which will make sense later. You've been warned. So let's just get started with setting something straight. I lied. We won't actually be ranking 152 shrines in these videos. Instead, we'll be ranking 148 of them, because there are four shrines that I feel you can't really rate the same way as all the others, and those would be the four tutorial shrines. You see, at the start of the game when you're stuck on the Great Sky Island that acts as the game's tutorial, there are four shrines that are each based around one of Link's Zonai arm abilities, namely Ultra Hand, Fuse, Ascend, and Recall. These are different from all other shrines because not only are they the only ones in the entire game that you're required to do, but they're also designed around teaching you how to use your abilities instead of being focused around actual puzzles. They do have puzzles in them, which I say with quotation marks, because they are so insanely easy compared to most other shrines, since their goal is just to show you how each ability works, rather than being, well, interesting. If you do want some kind of ranking for these, I'll quickly go over what I think of them from worst to best. While I think they're all good, my least favorite one is the Recall Shrine, the ability to rewind. This is the only one where you get the ability before entering the shrine, meaning you'll already have some experience with it when you enter. So the first two puzzles literally just being stand on a raft and recall it feels a little unnecessary. I do think the final puzzle where you have to recall one of two clock hands at the right time so they overlap is really clever. Though funnily enough you can also just stick them together with ultra hands, which I'm sure a couple people did on their initial playthrough. After that comes the first one, the ability to create, which gives you the most standard ability in the whole game, Ultra Hand. It starts by just showing you that you can move objects with it, and then that you can also stick objects together, which is as it should be. After that you have to make a little sliding platform with a hook, teaching you that you won't just be making platforms with this ability, but also contraptions to help you advance. This shrine doesn't really do anything wrong, but it doesn't do anything especially good either. After that comes the one that gives you Fuse, the ability to combine, and this one I think is really good. First it gives you a heavy weapon and a boulder, which when you fuse them shows you that you can create specific tools with it, in this case a hammer, that can be used to break stuff that looks breakable. Then you're given some fire fruits, a bow, and some arrows, which pops up a quick menu telling you that you can also fuse stuff to arrows when readying them, which you then have to use with the fire fruits you just got to burn down a chest on a wooden platform. After that you have to fight an enemy so you can learn that fusing stuff makes weapons better, but you've probably already realized that from the hammer tutorial at the start, so the enemy is also on the same kind of vines that you burned earlier, so you can have some fun and set the floor ablaze as well. There's also some random stuff like thorns and some weapons here for you to test around with fuse if you want to, but it's not necessary, just there if you want to toy around with the ability some more. And the best tutorial shrine is the ascent one, the ability to rise. I like this one the most because it heavily teaches you this unique mechanic through the tried and true game design philosophy of show don't tell. First you get an extremely basic showcase of the ability with one platform to ascend through, which is then followed up by two platforms but one of them has a chest on it and it doesn't reach the top of the wall, so even if you go with the one that progresses you, you'll know that it can be beneficial to look where the platform will pop you out before just blindly ascending into it. After that you fight an enemy which is honestly kind of pointless, but there's also a little drawbridge you can cut down and then ascend through, which teaches you that the ability also works with stuff you can interact with, instead of only stationary stuff like the previous two platforms you went through. 
And then finally, it teaches you that there's a height limit for ascent by having a pillar that's too high up with a moving platform under it that you can reach. Really smart design. Like I said, I think all of the tutorial shrines are good enough and do what they're supposed to. But if I had to rank them, I would put them in this order. Now with that all said and done, let's finally get into the actual ranking. There are five different types of shrines in the game and each one will have a little icon in the corner that are all made for this video by my good friend and returning artist on the channel, Pinky Bowtie. But don't worry too much about those, it's always very clear what type the shrine is and it doesn't really matter anyways, I just thought it would be fun. Also, I am ridiculously close to 300,000 subscribers and this project took forever to finish, so if you want to help me reach it, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I would really appreciate it, especially since I'm going to be making more videos like this in the future. But now, let's get into the bottom of the barrel, the least good shrines in the game, that I would all classify as pointless. You'll see what I mean. Obviously starting with the single worst shrine in the game. When I started this project, I thought it would be pretty hard to figure out which one would rank dead last, but no, there's a very clear winner here, or loser I suppose. And that is number 148, Otutsum Shrine, Roru's Blessing. Yeah, the worst shrine is a blessing, go figure. So what's the challenge for this one? What obstacle do you have to cross to get into this shrine? Nothing. No, I mean it, this is the only blessing shrine in the entire game that's just sitting in the overworld, like any normal shrine. I suppose there are a couple of these small ice taluses nearby, that's something, I guess. And there's also a Lionel behind it, but it's so far to the back of it that it really can't justify being the challenge. Yeah, this shrine just sucks, let's move on. Penny 10 Shrine, Combat Training, Throwing. So this is the first of the shrines dubbed Combat Training, which aren't really challenges, but act as tutorials for basic battle mechanics. Spoiler alert, all of these are bad, for two main reasons. A, every one of these teaches you something that a little pop-up during the actual tutorial or later in the game teaches you in just a few words. And B, they are insanely slow. Whenever you enter one of these shrines, you get a little scene of a construct waking up and then some text explaining what you have to do, which moves by at an absolute snail's pace. First, it always says this shrine purifies the ancient evil or whatever. Give it a second. Then it actually says what you have to do in this shrine. Give it another second. And then it always says that your other texts are ineffective here. Just a second again. Then it gives you a pop-up telling you what you have to do. And then finally you do the thing, which takes one second most of the time. After that, the shrine says well done with text that once again stays on screen for way too long. And guess what? Then you get some more text telling you to do the thing again. Yeah, in these combat training shines, they always make you do whatever it's teaching you two times, even though you obviously get the point after the first time. Anyways, doing that gets you a bit more slow moving text, and then the door to the exit finally opens, which also always houses the bonus chest, so these shrines really don't have one of those either. I think you can see why I think combat training shrines suck so much, but why is this the worst one? Well, for that we actually have to move on to... Number 146, Yamiyo Shrine, Combat Training, Throwing. Wait, what? Yeah, so this is one of only two instances in the entire game of a non-blessing shrine's name being used multiple times. And this one isn't even located that far from the other Combat Training, Throwing Shrine. Instead of teaching you extremely slowly how to throw weapons, this one teaches you extremely slowly how to throw materials instead. Which I can see having a bit more merit since that is a new mechanic that wasn't in Breath of the Wild, but this shrine still has no reason to exist, because the two combat training throwing shrines should have just been combined into one. Instead of the previous one making you throw a weapon twice, it should have just had you throw a weapon once and then throw a material for the second time. But no, we gotta make a whole new shrine for that, and make the player do it two times in between slow moving text boxes again. I really do not see the point in splitting these two shrines up, and be warned, you're gonna see a lot of combat trainings near the bottom of the list. Speaking of which... Number 145, Makuruki Shrine, Combat Training, Archery. Guess what this one teaches you? That's right, how to use a bow. No, that's literally it. First you shoot one guy, then you shoot three guys, that's it. You will almost certainly already have experience with shooting from the Great Sky Island tutorial section, especially since the Fuse tutorial shrine requires you to do so. Really, what's the point of this? Number 144, Sussup Shrine, Raru's Blessing. Wanna know what the challenge for this one is? It's in a well. That's it. There's another well nearby which if you go into it, you'll be locked behind some bars from which you can see this shrine, which is kinda neat I suppose. 
but there's nothing else in here so you can just ascend out walk towards the correct wall entrance assuming that wasn't the one you went in first and then you're good there's also a luminous stone talus nearby which doesn't really change much those guys are massive pushovers and they don't even attack you if you don't activate them first you may also think that because this is in a wet cave you'll have to find a way to get up to the shrine since you can't really climb but no you can just easily skill this slant before it you go down wells all the time in this game but for this one it leads to a shrine just because cool bro number 143 matsusi's shrine raru's blessing so do you remember those lome labyrinths from breath of the wild they're mazes which you had to navigate in order to get to the end which would give you a blessing shrine in that game because tears of the kingdom reuses breath of the wild's overworld they brought these mazes back without changing the layout of them so instead of making players figure out the same correct route again they just left acorns and nuts in a path that will lead you directly to the end and they still give you blessing shrines so these are literally just follow the acorns and get a shrine a blessing shrine at that wow that's lame so guess what shrine is next number 142 mayao taki shrine rao's blessing this is the lome labyrinth from the snow area same exact idea as the previous one which was the one in the desert just follow some nuts to get to the end the only reason this one ranked higher is because the shrine at the end is encased in ice and you gotta thaw it out yeah that's it number 141 sina tanika shrine combat training sneak strike this one obviously teaches you how to sneak strike that mechanic where you sneak behind an enemy to deal a super strong blow but this one is especially bad because it's by far the slowest combat training in the game which is really saying something because not only do you have to sit through all the slow text as usual but sneaking is just a slow mechanic by nature and you got to make sure you're not noticed because that can happen here after that they obviously make you do it a second time but against a moving target which is even slower not to mention that they warp you back to the start for it really nice guys number 140 joniu shrine rose blessing so this is our first of what I'm going to call crystal shrines, which are those ones where you find either a green crystal or an empty shrine pedestal, and interacting with either of them makes a straight green line project to the other. You then gotta go to the crystal, assuming that's not what you interacted with first, and bring it to the shrine base, usually with the use of a vehicle, which will then make the shrine appear, and these are usually blessing shrines. So with that explanation out of the way, why is Joniu shrine the worst of these? Well first you find the crystal in a cave, and then the projection line shows you that it's across a body of water. Okay, so you use some nearby materials to make a little boat to bring the crystal across the water, and then you quickly notice that it's literally just a straight shot forwards. There are no obstacles to avoid, no enemies trying to shoot you with bows, you just go forward. That's it. There's no challenge here other than building a vehicle, which I don't know if you've played this game, but you do that quite often over the course of a standard playthrough, so it's not very special. Number 139, Bamitok Shrine, Rose Blessing. I swear not all Rose Blessings are bad. Anyways, I want to use this entry to quickly go over what I like to call Cave Blessings, which are blessing shrines where the challenge is just the fact that they're located in a cave, which means you can't easily spot them from the sky and mark them down on your map, since you obviously can't see through cave walls and such. This is bad design for blessings in my eyes because the depths exist. I'm sure you already know this, but every single light route in the depths is directly below a shrine on the surface. Meaning that if you have every light route, which is very easy to do since light routes are never really hidden, you'll know the location of every shrine not in the sky, including the ones where the challenge is just finding them in a cave. If you go for all shrine completion without using the shrine sensor like I did in my initial playthrough, your last dozen or so shrines will be super underwhelming, because they'll all be cave blessings which you had no challenge in finding, since you already knew its location through the light routes, and there are about a billion caves in the game that don't have a shrine, so you usually don't expect to find one, but then when you do, it's just a random blessing. These cave blessings obviously suck, but let's go over this one specifically real quick. The entrance to the cave is maybe a bit hard to spot because it's in a little lake. Once in the actual cave, there are some obstacles like a couple vines you have to cut and some enemies, and at the end you put a plank on some water and use it to ascend up to the platform which has the shrine. Pretty standard stuff for a cave, but this one gives you a shrine just because. Number 138, Maoike's Shrine, Raru's Blessing. Here's another cave blessing. The premise here is that it's a boss Bokoblin outpost. Once you defeat them, which you obviously don't have to do, it's not like they're guarding a shrine crystal, you have to spot this giant bone ceiling and descend through it, which will then get you to the shrine that's obviously a blessing. That's it. Number 137, Yogao Shrine, Raru's Blessing. Guess what? This is another cave blessing. You're gonna see a lot of these near the bottom of the ranking. 
This one is next to the previous one on the ranking because it is almost the exact same thing. There's once again a boss Bokoblin group here that you don't have to kill, and instead of a bone ceiling you gotta notice, there's a big spire in the center of the cave surrounded by water, and you gotta notice a bombable wall on it. After you blow it up with a bomb arrow or something, you swim through the hole it left, and bada bing bada boom there's your blessing shrine. By the way, here's a fun strat to kill boss Bokoblins. Wait for them to round up all the little guys, stun them with a puff shroom or dazzle fruit, and then grab a heavy weapon and hold down the attack button while standing in the middle. I love doing that. Number 136, Maya Hisik Shrine, Rao's Blessing. Alright, strap in. This is the shrine that acts as the tutorial for the shrine sensor, which Robbie gives you when he moves back to the Hateno Ancient Tech Lab, which is locked behind a pretty lengthy and good series of quests. Robbie is first chilling at Lokat Landing, helping Yosha out with her research on the depths. Because Yosha is a kid, she's not allowed to go into the depths herself, and thus Robbie goes instead, so you have to go into the depths and look for him. Once you find him, he's looking at a statue, which he then asks you to take a picture of so you two can go back and show it to Yosha. When you do that, you have to come back later, or just reload the area real quick. And then Yosha will tell you that there are more of those statues that all point towards a mysterious power, so she sends you to go investigate on that. If you follow the statues, it will lead you to the abandoned central mine, where the mysterious power turns out to be the auto-build ability. After that, you're ambushed by the Yia clan and you have to do an awesome boss fight against the man, the myth, the legend, Master Koga, which sets up a whole separate quest chain of its own. After that, when you go back to Yosha, she gives you an auto-build preset for a hot air balloon and asks you to fix Robbie's broken one with it. If you do that, Robbie will use it to go to the Hateno Ancient Tech Lab, and then finally he gives you the shrine sensor, along with a quick tutorial on how it works, which will lead you to this shrine. Now this all sounds fine, right? This blessing shrine is just the result of all that questing, which was a lot of fun, and you get a useful shrine sensor out of it, not to mention the awesome auto build ability. I just have one itsy bitsy tiny little problem with all this. <clears throat> you don't need to do any of it. That's right, this shrine is completely available at any point. It's in a cave that's at least a little bit hidden because the entrance is blocked off by a breakable wall, but once you're in it's pretty much a straight shot to the shrine, Meaning this is actually just the same as any other stupid cave blessing, except this one just so happens to be used for the shrine sensor tutorial if you get it before finding the shrine yourself, which I and most people I know did. Also, this tutorial is buggy as hell. It definitely was not tested enough. It starts in the tech lab and you have to walk slowly in a very specific direction. If you go a little too fast or not exactly in the right direction, Robbie gets mad and tells you to try again, teleporting you back to him. The correct direction is close to the door of the lab, and if you're a little bit too close to it, you also fill. That was super annoying to deal with. And last thing before we move on, I'm gonna say something everyone else is too scared to say. The shrine sensor should not have been in this game. Not only does it completely remove all challenge of the dozen or so stupid cave blessings I already talked about, but the game literally has a built-in way of locating all the shrines that's way more fun, and that's to cross-reference them via the locations of the light routes in the depths. The shrine sensor in Tears of the Kingdom is stupid, which makes this quest for it and by extension the blessing shrine behind it also stupid. But let's just move on to the next entry. Number 135, Genodok Shrine, Rao's Blessing. Hey, this is our first shrine on a sky island. Cool. Anyways, this is a crystal shrine that starts at the pedestal, and directly next to it is one of those things you can ultra hand and spin around, which makes a giant platform behind it in the same shape mimic its orientation as you change it, which is a cool gimmick, but this one has you connect one end to where you're standing and another to the only other platform here. Not very hard to figure out, obviously. And then when you walk across it, the crystal is right there. So you pick it up, walk back over the bridge you spun, and then you're done. There's another shrine later on that has the same gimmick as this one, but actually does something cool with it, instead of just moving a bridge in place. So this one sucks. There's a chest hanging from the bridge you spin, which you can figure out how to get, but that has nothing to do with the shrine, obviously. Number 134, Igashuk Shrine, Rose Blessing. This is the last of the three Lome Labyrinth Blessing shrines, where you once again have to just follow some acorns to get to the end, but this one, while it still sucks, has an interesting idea behind it. Namely that it's located in the water, and there's a cave near the surface of the water that has you going all the way to the labyrinth under the water. There's some enemies in it as well, and even a Hinox near the end. After the cave, you ascend into the labyrinth that pops you out in a gigantic scary room with a gloom spawn in it, which, you know, is a pretty strong enemy. 
After defeating it or running away, you once again ascend through the labyrinth, at which point you can finally start chasing some acorns around to get to the end. This whole cave segment sounds pretty cool, right? But there's one problem with that. There's a cliff above the cave entrance that's high up enough for you to jump off of and simply glide towards the labyrinth's entrance, skipping the whole cave and underground room segment. If they had walled off this entrance to the labyrinth and forced you to go through the cave, this would rank a little bit higher. Number 133, Miryotanuk Shrine Proving Grounds Lure. This is our first Proving Grounds Shrine, so let's go over those real quick. Proving Grounds strip you of all your materials, gear, weapons, everything, and makes you defeat a bunch of construct enemies with what's provided within the shrine. Oh god, that sounds familiar to something bad. Well, don't worry, because usually the Proving Grounds shrines are very good, but obviously since there are quite a few of them, there's gotta be a couple stinkers, and this is sadly one of those. Proven Grounds usually have a theme or a central gimmick they focus on. This one is called Lure, so the gimmick is Luring Constructs, which is interesting. But sadly, the execution is kind of terrible. At the start, there are some lasers which from other shrines with them in it and Human Instinct you're taught to avoid. So you do, and then later you run into your first construct. It's sitting on a breakable block above one of those lasers, and you're given some exploding barrels. So you use it to break the platform and make it fall into the laser, right? Well, the explosion first makes the construct run away from the laser, but that's no big deal, right? After all, the gimmick is to lure constructs, so you just have it chase you and make it run through the laser. And yeah, that would be the case, but this is an archer, and archer constructs will never chase you and will always stay stationary. Ah, oh, well, okay, at least when it spotted you, it alerted some nearby constructs, and oh man, they're chasing me. Time to lure them into the laser and see what happens. Oh, well, that's disappointing. It just spits out some fire behind the laser, which they're likely to avoid while chasing you. And even if they do get hit by it, it's unlikely to kill them. Obviously, they do take some damage from it, which is fun, I guess. But normally, the themes of Proof and Grounds do end up killing the constructs if you utilize them. Anyways, a little further ahead is a setup for a cool trap. There are some flammable crates, a laser that'll shoot fire behind a wall, and some leaves on the ground on the other side of the wall. Obviously, we gotta stick the crates together so that when they ignite, they cause a chain effect of fire that will eventually burn the leaves, which we have to lure a construct onto so that it gets set ablaze. Awesome, let's set that up and look for a nearby construct. There's one left, and that's an archer, who will never chase you. Setting up that whole clearly intentional trap all for the last guy to be unable to be lured was one of the most disappointing feelings I've ever had in a shrine. You see what I mean when I said that the idea is cool, but the execution sucks? Also, that first set of lasers doesn't make fire shoot out of somewhere, but instead makes some huge metal balls roll down. I guess you're supposed to lure a construct all the way over there so that the balls can run them over, but how are you supposed to know those lasers will do that when instinct tells you to avoid them, and when all the other lasers in the shrine after those make fire appear, instead of metal balls? I seriously don't get what the designers were thinking with this shrine. And one last thing about Proofing Grounds, just like Comet Training and Blessing Shrines, they don't really have interesting bonus chests as they're just sitting at the end. But that's cool because like I said, Proofing Grounds are usually good. This one just isn't. Number 132, Sihajok Shrine, Varu's Blessing. This blessing is a reward for clearing one of those three skydiving challenges. I think those challenges are fun and all of them reward you with a shrine at the end, but then why is this one ranked so low? Well, this is the only one of the three that's a blessing, which just makes this one stand out so much, you know? Like, why does this one warrant being a blessing, but the others don't? I guess it's because this is probably the hardest of the three since there are clouds that block your view, which the others don't really have to the same extent, but it's still not very hard at all. You're not on a timer either, so this one being a blessing is just kind of a big letdown. Number 131, Irasak Shrine, Rose Blessing. This one is located in the Gravuda region and is surrounded by strong flowing sand that pushes you away. There are some wooden planks that drift across the sand and you gotta use those somehow, for example by recalling them and hopping from plank to plank, to make your way to the center where the shrine is. Sounds fine enough, right? Nothing really wrong with it. And yeah, I would agree, but there is a big problem with this shrine, and it's related to the main story quest of the game. When you first arrive in Gerudo Desert, there's a giant sand shroud covering the entire area, which makes it impossible to see where you're going when inside of it, and it even blocks out your map, making it even harder to navigate. Only after you clear the dungeon of the area, the Lightning Temple, does the sand shroud subside, which makes you able to freely explore Gerudo Desert without fear of getting lost. Well, to even make the dungeon appear, you have to go to three pillars that shoot a beam of light, and solve a small puzzle there to make it so that all the pillars are shooting their beam at each other, making a triangle. Neat stuff. 
These pillars are tall enough that when you stand on them, the sand shroud doesn't affect you or your minimap, and you can kind of see around you. And it also just so happens that one of those pillars is insanely close to this shrine. And not only that, but because of the sand shroud, it is impossible to see all the drifting sand around it, making it look like any ordinary shrine. So you glide towards it and go inside, not knowing any better, and boom, it's a blessing, which is really confusing. The idea behind this shrine is neat enough, but it's ruined by the fact that players are extremely likely to just glide over to it when they're doing this light beam puzzle for the story, meaning they accidentally skip the entire puzzle behind it, which happened to me this playthrough. This should have just been placed somewhere else in the desert without anything tall directly next to it. Number 130, Taki Ihaban Shrine, Rogo's Blessing. This is another cave blessing, but with the twist that there's a gloom spawn nearby. Uh, that's it. Gloom spawn has a kinda lengthy spawning in animation, so you can easily just climb the wall up to where the shrine is, and you won't have to deal with them as gloom spawns can't scale walls. It's located on the route to Rito Village, which the game definitely nudges you to go first after the tutorial, so I guess the challenge is that this is likely to be someone's first run in with the enemy, but yeah, this is an open world game, so that's not always guaranteed. It wasn't even my first run in with them either. Number 129, Isos Shrine Combat Training Shields, yet another combat training, and this one teaches you that parries can reflect slow moving projectiles. I can see some new players not knowing about this, and when they make you do it again, they also teach you that you have to keep the material of your shield in mind, as for example, doing it with a metal shield against an electric projectile will hurt you and make you drop your shield. It still works though, so it's not a big deal, and you always get healed at the end of a shrine, so the damage doesn't matter either. This is fine, I guess, but my problem is that this is almost pointless to learn. How often do you run into an enemy shooting slow projectiles at you? The only real instances of this are the wisp ropes which wield elemental rods, and guess what? They are immune to their own projectiles. The other 99% of times that enemies are shooting projectiles at you, it's because they are bow users. And not only are arrows really hard to parry because of how fast they are, but guess what? You can't reflect arrows. This mechanic was useful in Breath of the Wild because the best way to kill guardians was by reflecting their lasers back at them. But they aren't in Tears of the Kingdom anymore, so this is pointless. Anyways, from here on out the shrines get a bit better, but you know, still kinda disappointing and bad for a bit. Yeah, this game has a lot of shrines I'm not too positive about. Number 128, Yoku Shrine, Rose Blessing. This one just kind of annoys me. It's located by a vitality door that requires 10 hearts to open, which leads to the Construct Factory Dungeon, aka the Spirit Temple, meaning this shrine more so acts as a fast travel point for players who didn't have enough hearts the first time they tried it, and want a quick way to get back here when they think they have enough to try again. Personally, I really don't like the idea of having a shrine's main purpose be to act as a fast travel point. Every town, stable, and other important location you'd want to come back to has a shrine nearby so you can quickly warp to those locales, but none of those are blessings, so I don't know why this one has to be. If you go here when you're intended to, which is after all other dungeons and a lengthy main quest that makes a storm around here disappear, you start making your way through this big series of islands called the Thunderhead Isles, that has its own non-blessing shrine on it near the end. That shrine is super close to the end, and above the Dragonhead Isle, where the Vitality Door is. So you can just fast travel to that shrine and then fly towards where the Blessing Shrine is in less than a minute. Meaning the Blessing here literally only exists for players that skipped the Thunderhead Isles and went up here early by recalling a falling rock or something. Which again, I understand, but that still makes its only real purpose to act as a fast travel point. Which I'm not a fan of. Number 127, Kyono Shrine Combat Training. That's right, it's a combat training just called Combat Training, with nothing after it. This is the only one that doesn't make you do something twice, but instead it makes you do four different things one time each. First it wants you to do a flurry rush by side hopping, then it wants you to do another flurry rush but this time from a backflip, then it wants you to parry an attack with your shield, and then finally it wants you to do a spin attack. I'm kind of upset as hell that there's a shrine that teaches you about flurry rushes, because that's something new time players will almost certainly learn on their own eventually when they just so happen to dodge an attack at the right time, which is an awesome way to learn about that ability but this shrine potentially just takes that away. Other than that, learning to parry is kind of useless because, well, you already have to parry in the combat training that teaches you about reflecting projectiles, and it's probably not too hard after that to figure out that parries also work on physical attacks. And lastly, really, it teaches you about spin attacks? I can see maybe 0.001% of new players not figuring out about this ability on their own, but like, come on. Link's spin attack from The Legend of Zelda is like one of the most iconic video game attacks of all time. 
I'm sure that even if this is your first Zelda game, you'll probably figure out that you can do a spin attack on your own. For it being a pretty unique combat training, I feel like I can't be too hard on it, but it still suffers from being way too slow, especially because it makes you do four things with slow moving techs in between all of them. It's actually almost as slow as the sneak strike one I talked about earlier. Number 126, Utoja's Shrine, Raro's Blessing. This one is located in a cave and has a little outpost with two Zonai Spears and a book. If you read the book, it says, Legend has it, the Zonai hid a treasure in this cave long ago. The clue is as follows. Throw the Zonai Spear with a wing from the pedestal through the ring. Should your aim be true and right, you'll be blessed with the Spelling Light. So you grab one of the two Zonai Spears, climb up the pedestal, attach a key swing to it, and then you throw it to the ring and then you throw it through the ring, which makes the Blessing Shrine appear. Riddles in Zelda games are about as common as sand on a beach, but this one is just kind of pathetic. Let's look at the two lines of this clue. The second one just tells you that you'll get a reward if you figure it out, so only the first one is useful. And come on man, what is this? This isn't a riddle, this is literally just telling you what to do. Throw the zone I spare with a wing from the pedestal through the ring. A baby that can't read could figure this out. The act of aiming and throwing the spear is kind of fun, and it's smart that the entrance to this cave has some keys in it, so you'll almost certainly have a key swing on hand, but this is still kind of a weak riddle shrine. Number 125, Sua Rewak Shrine, Raro's Blessing. This shrine hurts me so much because it could have been great had they made one tiny change, so let's go over it. This shrine is tied to a quest that acts as an exam for Yiga clan members that they have to pass if they want to become Blade Masters, which are those big muscular Yiga members. And you undertake this exam yourself while undercover in the full Yiga armor set, so you gotta get that first. The test has you go to 5 different nearby points marked on your map to put some mighty bananas on a pedestal, which they also provide for you. There's one in a canyon, another one in the same canyon, one on top of a mountain with some mud around it, one at the entrance of a cave, and one pretty deep inside a different cave. After you've done all this, you return to the Yiga member at the start, he says you passed, and lets you into the door behind him, where you're rewarded with a non-decayed 8-fold blade, and there just happens to be a blessing shrine behind it, which is fine with me. But the problem I have with the shrine is that everything lines up for this to be a super interesting challenge, but they didn't go through with it. First of all, you have to wear the Yiga set to undertake this, because it's an exam made for Yiga members. And second off, it's located in the Gravuda region, which is known for becoming unbearably hot during the daytime, and unbearably cold during the nighttime. The Blade Master even tells you at the start that you'll have to survive the harsh cold and heat of this land. And since it's a Yiga exam and you have to wear the Yiga set, which doesn't provide you with any cold or heat resistance, you'd think you'd be forced to keep the Yiga set on the entire time, otherwise you'd get ambushed by Yiga members. But no, as soon as it gets too cold or too hot, you can just change into something that gives you resistance to the weather, which you're likely to have at that point because the three pieces of the Yiga outfit are pretty spread out across the map, so you have to do quite some exploring before you can even start this shrine quest. Like, come on. Everything lines up for this to be a perfectly designed challenge that makes the player use cold and heat resistant food that you have to cook, which is an insanely underutilized mechanic in both Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild if you ask me. The Blade Master should have just said something like, and remember, we'll be watching you to monitor your progress on the exam, so that if you take off the Yiga set during the test, you could get a text box that says something like, hey wait a minute, you're no Yiga member, you're Link, get him boys, and then you get ambushed by the Yiga clan, which happens in a few other places like the Yiga hideout for example. But as it is now, this quest is just a quick, hey go to these 5 spots and then come back for a shrine lol, which isn't very exciting at all, and it's just a huge wasted opportunity. Number 124, Tenmaten Shrine, Rose Blessing. Hey, remember near the bottom of the list how there was a shrine that you had to go into a well for? Well, this one also has you enter a well to get to it, and it's the last one like that in the game. Yeah, there are only two well blessings in the game, which are really just cave blessings in disguise. But this one actually makes you do something for it though. It leads to a very dark cave, and you're given some bright bloom seeds to light it up. There are a couple of enemies in the way also, and then it makes you cross a body of water, for which you're given a plank to use as a boat, but the somewhat interesting part is that the cave doesn't provide you with anything to use on the plank to make said boat be able to go forward. Literally every single other part of the game that makes you build something with Ultra Hand has some Zonai devices or other materials nearby for you to grab and use, but not this one. It kind of makes it stand out a lot in that regard, and it was the only time in this entire playthrough where I had to use Zonai devices from my own inventory. 
Everywhere else, I would always only use what was nearby and nothing more. Sadly, after that, it's pretty much a straight shot to the shrine, though. So there's not really a lot to it besides it making you use your own Zonai stuff and it being in a dark cave with water. And even then, you can probably make it by just swimming. Alright, these next four are all crystal shrines that are super similar, hence why they're all next to each other here on the ranking. Number 123, Mayam Shrine, Roro's Blessing. This is a crystal shrine that starts you at the base, and activating the line makes it point towards a nearby island, and once you fly over to it, you see that the crystal is stuck to a Flux Construct 1. So you beat it, get the crystal, and transport it back, which you do via this floating platform with some rockets to get it back up there. That's all. This kind of sucks because Flux Constructs are probably the single most common overworld boss in the game, and it's not fair to assume this will be many players' first one, since there's literally also one on the tutorial island. Granted, that's optional, but still. Number 122, Sisuran Shrine, Rose Blessing. This time, the crystal is stuck to an Ice Talus. Ice Taluses are pretty rare, so I guess it's fair to expect this one to be plenty of players' first one they run into, and early on, it can definitely give you some trouble, but it's still just a challenge you can find on other parts of the map, except this one just happens to give you a shrine, which is lazy design. There's also no interesting route you have to transport the crystal, because it's just a straight shot to the pedestal. Number 122, Sakun Bomar Shrine, Roro's Blessing. This one is located in Great Hyrule Forest, and it's tied to a quest from a Korok that makes you follow some glowing blue nightshade flowers, otherwise you'll get lost and be voided out. And after this, you'll find an empty shrine pedestal with a line that points towards a regular stone talus that has the crystal. And when you defeat it, you take the crystal to the shrine and you're done. The part where you follow the blue nightshades is kind of neat, but the route is so short that the moment is sadly over pretty quickly. And at this point of the game, stone taluses are not really an issue anymore. I mean, when you first enter Korok Forest, you have to fight a gloom spawn and phantom ganon, which is much harder than a stone talus. I do like the atmosphere of this fight though, since the fog in the Great Hyrule Forest looks super cool. Number 120, Usa's Home Shrine, Rose Blessing. This shrine has a small cool factor to it, and that's that when you activate the line pointing to the crystal, it goes directly through a wall, and when you go into the cave via the entrance above it, you'll see that the line is actually moving, which sets up a pretty ominous tone. Sadly, when you go around the corner, you see that it's only moving because a red Hinox has it, which is a huge pushover. But it's still kind of cool that you see it move without knowing why at first. It's definitely memorable, if not disappointing in the end. Number 119, Kahatanam Shrine, Rose Blessing. So this shrine is near the end of the climb up to the Wind Temple. You know, that incredible segment where you scale a massive series of floating platforms together with Tulin in a harsh snowstorm to make it up to the temple. That part of the game is crazy good. And then you get this shrine. Believe it or not, but for my first couple of drafts for this video, I actually had this shrine as the single worst one in the game. Because you do this climb to reach a dungeon, namely the Wind Temple, not for just another shrine, and a blessing at that. So I saw it as completely pointless. But then one of my brothers told me that he would actually prefer this being a blessing, because the last thing he'd want to do after such a cool climb to a dungeon is pause all that adrenaline that's built up just to spend a couple of minutes on a random shrine puzzle, which I really hadn't taken into consideration. That means that this shrine acts more so as just another quick fast travel point, in case you have to go back to make cold resistant food or something. But the thing is that almost everyone will have sufficient cold resist armor by now, since the snow cooled chest plate in Rito Village isn't that expensive, and you get a pair of cold resist pants during the tutorial. I'm still not very positive on this shrine, because again, I don't like it when the main point of a shrine is to be a fast travel spot, and shortly after this you get into the actual dungeon, which also acts as a fast travel spot, but at least it does make a bit more sense to me now that this is a blessing, though I still think this shrine doesn't really have a reason to exist. Number 118, Minatak Shrine, Roro's Blessing. This is another cave shrine, but the cave is really dark, so you gotta light it up with bright blooms, which is not a unique gameplay mechanic in the slightest because the depths exist, where you do the same thing except it's the size of an entire overworld. There are also quite a lot of horror blinds here, and it's a bit of a maze. Also near the end, there's this part where you can shoot a bright bloom seed through a little lip in the wall, which reveals that there's a shrine here, which is kinda cool but not necessary. A bit of a weak shrine considering it's just a miniature version of the gameplay loop in the depths. Number 117, Kisi Nona Shrine, Wind Power. That's right folks, 31 shrines in and we finally have our first regular shrine. I can hardly believe it. Anyways, what makes this one disappointing? Well, it has a neat concept, namely that there's this wheel with a bunch of propellers around it and attaching a fan makes the wheel spin and also activates the propellers around it when the wind hits them, 
but it's not fast enough so you gotta attach another fan facing the opposite direction on the other side of the wheel so that all propellers will activate which opens the door and that's the whole shrine really it's an interesting idea like i said but the problem is that it's insanely short i feel like they could have easily come up with one or maybe two more puzzles featuring this concept but no the shrine is over almost as soon as you get what it's about also since this is our first normal shrine we finally get to also take the bonus chest into account this one is just kind of whatever you just take one of those fans and use it to paraglide up to it woo also don't worry i won't be mentioning every single normal shrine's bonus chest only if i have something to say about them if I don't mention a shrine's bonus chest, it was just kinda whatever. Number 116, Moshe Pin Shrine, Rao's Blessing. This is a cave blessing. Wanna know what you do to get to the shrine? Breaking rocks. A lot of breaking through rocks. You can't use bomb flowers in this cave because it's in the Elden region, so they blow up in your face as soon as you try to throw them. Meaning the fastest way to get through these rocks is by using either Unobo's charge ability or Riju's lightning arrow ability. But if you don't have those yet, you'll be doing a lot of this. Which is about as fun as it looks. That's not the end though, because after all that digging, you find a crystal that you have to transport over a magma lake. And there's a hydrant and a fan nearby, so you gotta use the hydrant to make an obsidian slab and attach the fan to it to make a little boat. Which is cool, but it doesn't last very long as it's just a straight shot. So the main focus of the shrine is really just digging, which is boring. There's another shrine that utilizes boats made out of obsidian slabs in the actual shrine, which is why I'm not too positive on this one doing it, even though it's a cool idea. Number 115, Kamizun Shrine, Proven Grounds, Beginner. So as the name implies, this acts as an introduction to Proven Grounds. It's actually a really bad Proven Grounds, as there's no theme, and since this is intended as the first Proven Grounds, that might make players think that they never have themes, if it actually is their first one. I also just don't see the point in having an introduction to Proven Grounds. All of them start with a little text box telling you that your gear has been removed, and you always get at least something to defeat the enemies with, so it's pretty easy to get the idea. It doesn't really do anything super wrong, so I can't be too hard on it, I suppose, but I still think it's kinda bad. Number 114, Nauda Shrine, Proven Grounds Intermediate. Okay, this one actively pisses me off. Not only is it another unnecessary themeless introduction to Proven Grounds, but it actually does have something it clearly wants you to do, and it's really pointless and stupid. First, it wants you to kill the construct by the fire fruit so you can use those to burn down a shock emitter so you can use that to power a fan so you can run up a slope to use the fan to fly over to a corner surrounded by breako blocks that has tools to make a hammer so you can smash out of said blocks all just to give you that hammer, which will just be a pain to use against the captain, who has a lot of health and the hammer does not do much damage, is slow, and doesn't even stun the captain. So it'll just keep knocking you off the platform, making you climb back up. Like, what the hell is that clearly intended series of events? There's also two archers above this platform standing on metal that you're obviously supposed to use shock fruits on to shock them, but by this point I didn't care anymore and just used set fruits on the captain. I did have this funny death from the captain using wall hacks though. That's right, shoot me. You, what, what? Huh? What the fuck? Number 113, Soryo Tanok Shrine, Buried Light. This shrine is just a lot of blowing sand away. That's pretty much all you do here. The buried light in the name refers to this light you have to uncover from some sand near the end of the shrine. So you can point this mirror towards another room, letting you open the door to the exit. Other than that, this shrine is just a lot of blowing sand away, which isn't very exciting. The bonus chest is very clever though. It's up on a platform for which you have to use a fan to get up there, and there's some more sand obstructing your gear that you have to blow away. But because you used a fan to get up there, you don't have another one on hand for the sand. Luckily, there was an enemy before this that had a weapon with a fan fuse to it, so you're supposed to take that weapon and use it on the sand up on the platform. That's very well thought out in my opinion. But besides that, this shrine kinda blows. Get it? Okay, I'll move on. Number 112, Egoshan Shrine, Orbs of Water. This one is based on these floating water orbs, which are a very unique Zonai device, if you can even call them that. But the puzzles here are honestly pretty bad. For the first puzzle, you literally just have to hop into a ball as it takes you to the ledge you have to reach. I get that it has to introduce the concept, but couldn't they have at least made you move it or move something out of the way of its path? Anyways, for the second puzzle, you have to recall a water orb as it falls from where you have to go, and then hop into it as it goes back up. Not very creative. 
After that comes my main disappointment with this shrine though. There isn't really a puzzle at all here. Literally all you have to do is hop into another water orb, which hits a ramp that makes it go upwards a bit, which only exists to spoil the solution of the next puzzle, for which you just have to make a slant with a sliding block stuck to a rail and a convenient metal plank, so that another water orb can hit that slant and go towards the exit of the shrine. When going through all my shrines in my streams, I actually ranked this one pretty decently. I mean, I guess a 6 is fair. It, well, 7, it is kind of unique. But now that I'm reviewing them all again, I can see that this one actually kind of sucks. And the only reason I was positive on it at all was just because those water orbs are a super rarely used and pretty cool concept. My problem with the shrine is that for it making use of such a rarely used object in the game, it doesn't do anything cool with them at all. In fact, you don't even really get to interact with them by themselves. Let's look at the four required uses of them here. First, you just hop into one as it floats upwards. Then you recall one just to hop into it as it floats upwards. Then you, again, just hop into one as it hits a slant and flies diagonally. And then finally, you make a quick slant and then just hop into another orb to get to the end. I almost feel like the developers forgot that you can ultra hand these balls when making the puzzles in this shrine. The bonus chest makes you do that to catch a falling wooden chest with it, and it's the only cool part of the shrine. But even then, I suppose you could also just ultra hand catch it from midair. You can also stick stuff to the floating rock in the center, which the upcoming water temple does utilize. It's such a shame that this shrine wastes the concept of those orbs because believe it or not, this is the only shrine in the entire game that uses them. Other than here, the only place you'll find them is when climbing up to the water temple and in the temple itself. I definitely feel like they could have made some way cooler shrine puzzles with these. Number 111, Tanino Shrine, Bravo's Blessing. This is a crystal shrine in the Sky Islands. When you activate the shrine pedestal, you'll see that the line goes into another nearby Sky Island. I'm pretty sure you're meant to use this big floating platform with a fan to get to it, but there's a launcher nearby that's supposed to be used for another island that you can spin towards the one with the crystal. Who wouldn't use that instead? There's also another island below it where you can build something with hot air balloons, but again, just use the launcher. Once you're on the Sky Islands, you'll eventually notice this huge gap in the other side of it, which has some vines you gotta get rid of by either burning or cutting them, and behind that is a floating platform, some materials to build a flying machine with, and another set of vines which the crystal is behind. So you make a floating plane, put the crystal on it, and then make your way back around to the shrine pedestal. You might be thinking, yeah, that's not super exciting, but it doesn't sound that bad. Why is this shrine ranked so low? And here, I'll tell you why. Number 110, Yuku GC Shrine, Rose Blessing. This is the same thing. Like, really, it reuses the exact same room for the crystal. But instead of a floating platform, you're given a wing, so you make a generic plane instead. The Sky Island with the crystal is also a bit further away from the shrine pedestal, so you actually gotta make something to get over to it. Hence why this shrine is a spot higher. But other than that, this is the same thing. Activate a crystal line, follow it to a Sky Island, Get rid of two sets of vines to get to the crystal, make a flying machine with almost the same materials, and fly back. Believe it or not, there's actually a third shrine that reuses this, but that one is actually good, so we'll be seeing it way later in the ranking. For now, these shrines would have been good if the idea and the actual Sky Island wasn't just completely reused like this. Number 109, Jojon Shrine, Proven Grounds, Rotation. This Proven Grounds pretends to have a theme, but it doesn't. It's called rotation, so what do you do with that? There are two turning gear platforms and one of them has an archer on it. That's about the extent of the rotation gimmick. Other constructs are too afraid of the cocks to get on them, so that doesn't really use the gimmick. There's also a second floor which you reach by recalling a sideways cock. This floor has another turning cock with two flame emitters on it, but there are no enemies near there and also there's a bridge next to it that doesn't have this spinning flame trap. And that's where the actual enemies are. So you can just completely ignore that last rotating cog. After this, the shrine is over. Yeah, cool theme, bro. Number 108, Yomisuk Shrine, Raru's Blessing. The main problem with this one is that it pretends to be tied to a quest, but it isn't. There's a Zora in Zora's Domain that tells you that there's an ancient manuscript about a shrine of some kind near a place called Tarn Point, and that her daughter, Finley, went to go check out with another NPC called Cezanne. When you get there, you find Cezanne with a raft, and he says that Finley is on the other side of this body of water, with spikes in it that keeps bopping up and down, so he's scared to use his raft to get over to her. You make a weapon that shoots wind with some nearby materials, put the raft in the water, tell Cezanne to hop aboard, and then the two of you make your way over to Finley. 
This part is actually pretty interesting and fun. Like I said, the water level bobs up and down, so you gotta be careful to use that to your advantage to get over the spikes, and also to make sure you avoid the spikes appearing from below you so you don't get flipped over. It's pretty cool. Once you get to the other side, Susan and Finley are reunited and they talk about the shrine that is there for a bit, after which you can enter and then it's a blessing shrine. Sounds pretty okay, right? But like I said, the shrine isn't really connected to this quest, because if you get here without talking to the Zora in Zoro's domain and activating the quest first, Sasan and Finley won't be here, but the shrine will be. You can very easily make your way over to it, and then you can just enter it no problem, making the quest completely pointless and optional for the shrine. I don't understand why they didn't make it so that Sasan and Finley are always in the cave, even if you haven't accepted the quest, and that if you tried going across the water without Sasan, he would stop you and ask you for your assistance in getting across forcing you to do that raft section if you want to get into the shrine. This whole quest is clearly the justification for this being a blessing, so why can you just skip it? It makes no sense to me. Number 107, Town He Shrine, Combat Training, Archery. Yeah, so this is the other shrine that shares a name with another. If you remember, there was an archery training shrine with the same name earlier, so why is this one better? Well, I think that what it teaches you actually makes sense to teach on its own. It's not focused on just shooting, like the other one. Instead, it focuses on bullet time, which I can totally see new players not finding out about on their own. And it even makes a bit of sense for players that are already familiar with the combat from playing Breath of the Wild before, since bullet time's mechanics have changed. Instead of continuously draining your stamina while in bullet time, it instead only drains about a third of a wheel every time you shoot, which returning players may not initially notice, but they probably will here. Also, it's worth noting that this shrine is the reward for one of the three skydiving challenges in the game. Doesn't feel like much of a reward at all, but it does make this shrine a tiny bit better because of it. It's also the last combat training shrine, so we're finally done with those. Thank god. Number 106, Mayao Miki Shrine, Downward Force. This shrine is based around those flying ships that bounce you upwards when you land on them, which you also do during the climb up to the Wind Temple. In fact, this shrine is located there, and it comes right after the first one of those bouncing ships, which introduces the concept. Anyways, after a quick puzzle where you shoot a switch through some gates, there's a bouncy ship here to introduce the concept. Again. That's a little weird. Anyways, after this you enter the main part of the shrine, where the goal is blocked off and you gotta find a way to open the gate under it, which you do by shooting a switch through some gates. Yeah, I don't understand why the shrine had to open with the same puzzle. It makes it so that when you get here, you already know what to do. So the only interesting part about this shrine is getting to the switch via the bouncy boats, which you experience before and after the shrine. So this is just kind of a waste of time if you ask me. Also, this shrine has a really bad kind of bonus chest that is sadly pretty common. It's up on a little ledge you just gotta notice and then fly over to it. I don't like these types of bonus chests that you just have to kind of see on a random wall somewhere. Because they make it so that no matter what, you feel like you might be missing something if you're not constantly looking up at every wall. This is the same kind of design that people say aged badly about Ocarina of Time, where some puzzles were just look around the room until you spot something you can interact with, which that game only had because it was the first 3D Zelda game and that concept was super revolutionary. So I don't know why it's in this game in a lot of shrines. These kind of chests suck, but like I said, it doesn't really lower the score of a shrine much if they have a bad bonus chest. Just makes it so that they miss out on other points they potentially could have had. Number 105, Apojak Shrine, Wings on the Wind. Man, does it feel good to finally talk about shrines with unique names. Anyways, first you see some Zona wings flying by, and you gotta grab one for yourself so that you can transport this orb to where it has to go. After that, there's this ledge with fans in the ground blowing upwards that you gotta use to get up, where there are more wings and you gotta remember the fans from before so you can grab one and put it on a wing in order to fly across this huge gap to get to the exit. The puzzles here are fine, I guess, but the shrine is clearly a showcase for the wing zonai device, which doesn't make much sense to me. From the tutorial, wings are easily the device you'll have the most experience with, and this shrine makes you watch a live showing of how they work before you can grab your own. Like, yeah, I know, thanks, just give me the damn wing. Also, I just want to show that you can do this shrine without putting a fan on the wing by just ascending at the end, which I can totally see some players doing, not realizing they did the shrine wrong, which would just make this one suck a bit more. Number 104, Orochium Shrine, Courage to Fall. So this shrine is kind of infamous for its poor design choices, but I think it's a bit overplayed to be honest. Let's imagine for a second that you've never played a Zelda game before, and this is your first shrine somehow. 
After opening up the door at the start, you're treated to some lasers, and pretty much anyone that's ever consumed any type of media in their life knows that lasers are usually not a good thing to touch. This is pretty standard human knowledge by now, and this shrine even reinforces that because touching these lasers makes you drop into the void, taking a heart of damage. After respawning, you instead take this side route to the back, which has you fight some enemies, and eventually drops into the room behind the lasers. Nice, you've cleared what was previously established as being an obstacle preventing you from advancing. Here you open another door and you see another set of lasers, so naturally you dodge them again. You fight some more enemies, ride an elevator upwards, and come across a hole to put an orb in, which you saw earlier behind some bars. So how do we get it out of there? While before the elevator there was also some grating on the floor, which when you look through it, you can see a chest, hinting that there is a lower floor here, and the only way to get there is to go back to the second set of lasers so you can touch them and drop down. And that is pretty much the only puzzle in the entire shrine. After this you just take the orb to the goal which lets you get to the exit. I get the design idea here, but it completely relies on the player touching that first set of lasers to learn that they make you drop down, so you can realize you're supposed to drop down with the second pair of lasers, but every fiber of your being will tell you not to touch lasers, so most people will just ignore the first pair to begin with. For all they know, the lasers just hurt you outright like other lasers in this same game, or any other game they've played before. I don't think it's the best design to have puzzles a lot of players might not solve because they aren't trying random stuff they normally wouldn't do, like touching lasers. Besides that whole thing, I just think the shrine has too much stuff in it, from the random combat to the random ascent port, and even after you figure out the only aha moment, you still have to transport an orb to a goal that gives you a wing with some fans that lets you transport the same orb further to an earlier hole for the orb to go into, which opens up the exit. It's not a completely awful shrine, but it's just not really well designed in my opinion. Number 103, Gasas Shrine, Well Timed Cuts. So this shrine really confuses me, and not in a good way. It's called Well Timed Cuts, and the first thing you see is a block on a rope. The shrine provides you with some arrows, so you'd probably assume this shrine revolves around swinging things and then shooting the ropes at the right time. But no, not really. You're not supposed to swing this first block, but instead just let it fall down so you can step across the gap with it. Okay, then there's a puzzle with another block which really doesn't seem to have an intended solution at all, but what I think you're supposed to do is grab the other block from before, attach it to the corner like so, and then stand under it so you can descend through it. Okay, then you literally just make a bridge to cross a gap, then you put a weight on the bridge so you can cut this chest down with a key in it, and then finally at the end the name of the shrine comes into play, as there's a giant orb hanging from a rope above the abyss. So you gotta swing it and get a well-timed cut to make sure it goes towards the goal instead of falling into the void. This shrine just feels like a bunch of random ideas thrown together, and when they had to think of a name, they just used what was fitting for the last puzzle in it. I suppose to get the bonus chest you also have to time a cut, but since you just made a bridge to catch another chest, you can just do the same thing here. And because of that, it might make players think you're supposed to do that for the orb at the end as well, since that also works. I guess the shrine isn't that bad or poorly designed, but it's just super unfocused. There's no theme at all, and the name just makes it more confusing. Number 102, Yeraum Shrine, Proven Grounds, Infiltration. With a name like Infiltration, you'd think the theme here would be stealth, but it's not. In fact, there really isn't a noticeable theme at all here. Again. The first enemy moves back and forth between two pillars here, making you think you'd have to sneak behind it and sneak strike, but it moves way too fast for you to be able to get behind it while sneaking before it turns around and sees you. The second enemy will always spot you if you try to reach its back unless you abuse their poor view distance, which doesn't feel intentional. And after that, the last segment is just randomly blocked off by some spikes on the ground and just has a bunch of randomly placed enemies that will 100% of the time notice you when you enter, so you just go in guns blazing. The only real interesting thing here you can do is turn off this homing construct head, replace its fire emitter with a nearby laser emitter, and then turn it on near the last construct to let it get killed by it. But other than that, this proof and grounds is just kinda random. Number 101, Ga Ahisa's Shrine, Raru's Blessing. This is located on a sky island in low gravity. First you have to interact with this panel that lowers the water on the island, so you can enter this cave with a breakable wall. After that, you'll see that this is in a dark cave with a light redirection puzzle, which sounds very promising, but it's too simple. First, you shine the light towards this platform with a mirror, then you continue that beam at about a 30 degree angle to shoot it at this platform with a mirror, then you continue the beam at about a 30 degree angle at this platform with a mirror, then you point the beam through this hole towards a mirror on a ceiling pointing downwards, where there's an enemy with a mirror shield that you grab from it and use to redirect the light to a panel directly in front of you. 
This finishes up the puzzle and opens up the path to some stairs that lead directly to the shrine. This light puzzle is just too simple to really stand out. You first do the same thing a couple of times, and by the time you're at the end, the puzzle is pretty much already solved. Having to kill the enemy and take its mirror shield at the end is somewhat interesting, but that's about the extent of it. Also, the zero gravity here really does not matter at all. The puzzle wouldn't be any different if it wasn't regular gravity. Number 100. Under the Mimic Shrine, a retracted path. This shrine has a cool idea, but it's over way too quick. So there's this structure that spits out giant orbs with a hole for that orb to go into on the side, and hitting this switch makes the whole thing move horizontally. So you're supposed to realize that the orb goal ends exactly where the ball is shot out from, so you can recall it and hit the switch to make it go into the goal, and doing that opens the exit to the shrine. It's a very interesting puzzle like I said, but it's the only one in the entire shrine. Even the bonus chest just has you move the structure and then ascend to it. I can hardly call that a puzzle. I feel like the devs could have made a couple more puzzles with this idea, but they didn't. Also, this was actually the last shrine I finished in this playthrough, so it was kinda disappointing for it to be so aggressively mid. But anyways, that was shrine number 100. We're at the double digits now, and we're already over an hour into the ranking. This is gonna take a while. Number 99, Ishokin Shrine, Raro's Blessing. This one is super interesting to me. There's an NPC with a shrine crystal that'll give it to you if you show him a giant horse and there just so happens to be one nearby, the Great White Stallion. So you catch it, slowly ride it over to the NPC, which flabbergasts him and lets you take the crystal to the shrine pedestal, which is pretty nearby. If this was all there is to the shrine, I think it'd be a lot weaker, but this is probably the shrine that depends the most on context in the entire game. You see, there's another giant horse that also works to this quest, a black one with orange hair that's based on Ganondorf's horse from Ocarina of Time, and that horse was also in Breath of the Wild. If you've played Breath of the Wild and registered this horse in a stable, you'll already have it captured in Tears of the Kingdom because registered horses are carried over, meaning you can just go to a stable, take out that horse from your Breath of the Wild save file, and bring it over to the NPC. Some people have said that this misses the point of the quest, but personally I love it. This is how I did this shrine in my first playthrough, and it acted as a really cool way to remember my previous journey through this world. Almost like this puzzle took me 6 years to finish. Like even though I played the crap out of Breath of the Wild, I still wasn't done with everything in that game, since capturing a giant steed there helped me solve a puzzle here. I really like that. Sadly, if you haven't played Breath of the Wild, this shrine just boils down to get one of the two big horses, ride it over to this NPC, and you're done which isn't very interesting, so that's why I can't rank the shrine much higher than this. Too context sensitive, but personally I think it's really cool. Number 98, Sahiro Shrine, Age from Above. This one features lasers and doesn't really do much wrong, but it's not that interesting either. You're just put in a couple different hallways with lasers to dodge, and at some point you have to randomly use a sense once to proceed. At the end, a wall of lasers that you have no way of dodging comes towards you, so you gotta notice that there's some room right before them where you can use a sense to get above them. This is fine enough, but I don't like that you had to randomly use Ascent before this point for no real reason other than to remind you that you have that ability. It makes it so that instead of figuring out you have to use Ascent here at the end under a time limit, you instead just go, oh I gotta use Ascent, like earlier in the shrine, got it. Also at one point there's a split in the road, with the left side taking you to those final lasers and the right side to the bonus chest, but if you go left first, a gate slams shut behind you, which never opens again. So if you didn't get the bonus chest yet, you'll have to re-enter the shrine after you finish it to go get the chest, which as far as I know is the only time in the whole game where a shrine can hard lock you out of getting a bonus chest unless you re-enter it later. The bonus chest is also random as hell, you have to hit a laser with a block which opens a gate to the chest, which is the only time in the entire shrine where a laser does anything other than hinder you, makes it feel kind of arbitrary. Number 97, Siwakama Shrine, Moving the Spheres. First you use a ball as a bridge to the other side, then you attach it to another ball so they don't roll off the slant below to use them as a bridge to the other side, then you attach them to another ball so they don't roll off the slant below to use them as a bridge to the other side. That's the whole shrine. I like the concept behind it, but it's kinda lame how all three puzzles have basically the same solution. I do really like the bonus chest though, you're supposed to notice this slant off to the side that points towards a breakable wall. So you put one of the balls on the slant and let it roll into the wall to break it, letting you get the chest behind it. This is a great example of how a good bonus chest can elevate an otherwise forgettable shrine a bit, since in this case it's the only instance where you use balls for something other than a bridge. 
Number 96, Jikaku Shrine, Varu's Blessing. This crystal shrine is extremely simple. The line towards the crystal points upwards, so you gotta obviously make your way up. There's a launcher nearby that'll send you up to a higher island, which has the same launcher to again send you upwards, which has the same launcher again, but there's a floating platform above it that you gotta knock away first by placing one of the nearby big blocks on it to hit it away. That one finally brings you to the crystal, which you then get to drop from very high up to the shrine pedestal, which in my case landed extremely close to where it would have triggered the shrine to spawn. Makes me wonder if it's possible to exactly slam dunk it from all the way up there. Like I said, it's super simple, but it is just kind of fun. Launching Link is always enjoyable, and throwing the crystal at the end is just, you know, fun, which is what games are supposed to be. But I still think this shrine is just okay. Not very standout, but okay. Number 95, Otak Shrine, Proving Grounds, Traps. So the theme here is obviously using traps to defeat constructs, but in reality there's only one type of trap, which is burnable floors, because almost every construct is standing on some dry leaves that you can burn. The first one just has you drop a candle on top of it, then you do it again except you first gotta lure the nearby construct on top of the leaves, which doesn't even die from the fire, then you gotta set the floor on fire with an exploding barrel, which is way more likely to kill the constructs itself, then there's another trap that doesn't involve fire, but I don't think it's very well made. At the start of the shrine there is a block being held up by a breakable pillar, and at the end of the shrine is a boulder that you can use to fuse to a weapon to make a hammer. So you gotta lure the last lurable construct to stand under that block, and then break the pillar with the hammer so the block falls on it. Which doesn't kill it, it has too much health, and there's a tiny gap between the block and the ledge that's supposed to stop it from escaping. This is really anticlimactic, but I was still able to make it work by just continuously recalling and redropping the block on top of it. Pretty funny, but still not as satisfying as I wanted it to be. The falling block here should have just one shot at the construct. Maybe they should have stuck some explosive barrels at the bottom or something, I don't know. Number 94, Ninji Shrine, Varu's Blessing. This one is in Korok Forest, and a Korok there tells you that they have a special place that has a green swirl, obviously hinting towards it being a shrine. They say that from there you can see an island floating in the sky, and that only Koroks can reach it because everyone else will just get lost due to the fog surrounding it. Which is true, because if you try to go there on foot, you'll be teleported away. You're supposed to piece together that since you can apparently see a sky island from where that shrine is, you have to go to said sky island from which you can see the green swirl, and drop in from above. That's really the entire puzzle, but I kinda like it. It forces you to pay attention to what the NPC tells you, and it doesn't feel like you can easily accidentally solve this since dropping into Korok Forest from above usually doesn't go very well, which I actually tried in my first playthrough since I initially couldn't figure out how to get into Korok Forest. But that could just be me though, for all I know most people did accidentally solve this before going to Korok Forest, but either way I still like it. Anyways, quick side note, when I streamed my entire playthrough for this video, I gave every shrine a number rating from 0 to 10 in my notes, which was just so I could put shrines in different quality groups, making it easier for me to actually rank them from worst to best. We just passed the last shrine that I gave a 4 out of 10, meaning the next ones were a 5 out of 10, which is, you know, the average score since 5 is half of 10. This means that from here on out, I think shrines are at the very least okay enough to be passable in my eyes. This also means that yes, I think over a third of all shrines in this game are somewhat lacking. I really meant it at the start of this video when I said that I think this game has a lot of weak shrines, and while obviously I find 4 out of 10s a lot better than 0 or 1 out of 10s, they are still lacking. I didn't feel this way about nearly as many shrines in Breath of the Wild. Which I guess is partly because that game has less shrines overall, but still in my opinion I'd rather have less shrines overall if the average quality of them is higher. But yeah, all the following shrines scored at least a 5 or higher out of 10. Meaning the next couple are just middle of the road passable. You know, they're good enough. Number 93, Mayata Shrine, a sliding device. This shrine first shows you how Zonai sleds can slide on sand, which after recalling one to get up to the next part, has to create a hovercraft with a sled, so you can cross the large amount of quicksand in this room. Sadly the shrine is almost over once you've made the hovercraft, since from there on out it's just a short straight shot to the end, but luckily the bonus chest has you instead go to the left off the beaten path after which you can glide down to make another hovercraft. This shrine is so lucky that sliding on sand with a hovercraft is as fun as it is, otherwise this would have ranked quite a bit lower. Number 92, Rakaku Dai Shrine, Roro's Blessing. At first it seems like you just have to make a super standard vehicle to transport the crystal to where it has to go, but then it turns out you have to ride said vehicle over some small waterfalls, which is funny and pretty cool. There's really not much else to this shrine though. The vehicle you create is practically already made when you get the materials, but I think that's fine since if they had you make a vehicle from scratch, many players would probably make something that wouldn't be able to cross the waterfalls, since it's obviously not clear from the start that you're gonna have to do that, which would have been very frustrating to learn after building it. 
Number 91, EC Seam Shrine, Proofing Grounds in Reverse. Obviously, this one is based around using Recall for combat, which is interesting as that's not an ability you generally associate with being effective in a fight. And I honestly don't think this shrine really makes it work, but it is a pretty funny shrine despite that. First, you have to recall a turning cock to get up, because of course. And then while you're distracted with an enemy throwing rocks that you can probably recall, you'll have another one toss a time bomb at you, which you're supposed to recall because they'll explode when they get back to the thrower. And that's really about the only instance where you can use recall to defeat enemies. The captain here fuses time bombs to its sword, so it's funny to get him to swing, which activates the time bomb, and then run away until it explodes. After that, I fused a time bomb to his spear and threw it at the last enemy, clearing the shrine. Again, I think the idea of this shrine is interesting, but it doesn't really execute it well, because I don't think you can make the concept work. Like I said, it's a pretty funny shrine though, and that's really the only reason I like it. Number 90, Pupunki Shrine, Rose Blessing. This is another one in Korok Forest. An NPC with a shrine crystal says that they're willing to give it to you if you bring them 5 golden apples. And they also tell you that up ahead is a dangerous bog that has some trees at the end that grow golden apples. Traversing the bog is pretty fun since you have to make a large bridge of some kind from tree logs to cross the mud, and there are some enemies to fight. After that you collect the golden apples, get back to the Korok and give them the apples, and then they give you the crystal for the shrine which is also nearby the Korok. Like I said, going to collect the golden apples is pretty fun, but this shrine has a sizable problem in that I feel like it's pretty likely for players to already have 5 golden apples when they start the quest, since you can find them on a lot of sky islands and even on the surface in some places. Ironically, I didn't have 5 golden apples because in this playthrough I pretty much only focused on getting to all the shrines without going out of my way to collect stuff, but I remember that in my initial playthrough I did have enough by the time I got here, meaning the quest was over as soon as I accepted it, which obviously isn't as fun. But then again, I saved going to Korok Forest until the very end of my run, so I can totally see players getting here earlier without enough golden apples, since they are kinda rare. Number 89, Siba Jitak Shrine Alignment. This one has a pretty cool concept. There's a giant spinning pillar with some protrusions on it made up of different segments. You gotta recall the segment and cancel the recall at the right time to make the protrusions lined up so you can ascend all the way to the top. And that's the shrine, there's only one puzzle. In that sense, this shrine is similar to a retracted path, which also had a cool idea but only used it for one puzzle. But I think this one is better since there's another element of challenge to it, namely timing the recall cancels so the pillars line up, not to mention realizing that that's what you have to do. But again, I think they could have done more with the idea. The bonus chest kinda sucks. To get to it, you have to do the exact same thing but not all the way to the top. And even if you don't get it first, you could just notice it when you're at the top and then glide down to grab it. After that, you can just jump down to ascend the pillar again, which literally adds no challenge to the shrine and only wastes your time. Number 88, Sonapan Shrine, Missing Pathways. This shrine focuses on ascent and is pretty simple. First, it has you ascend to a platform, introducing the idea. Then it has you put a block on a platform so you can ascend through that to reach a higher ledge. And then finally, it has you take a block from the corner of a wall, place it in the water, which is normally too deep to stand in, use ascend in the gap that the block was originally in, glide onto the block you placed down, and then ascend from there. Like I said, simple, but fine. What really stands out here though is the bonus chest. It's stuck in a wall and there's an unclimbable block stuck to the ground via a rail that you can only move left and right. So what do you do? It almost feels like there isn't an intended solution, but what I did was move the block to the right so it aligns with the chest, grab the block from the main puzzle, attach it to the right corner of the sliding block so I could stand under it, ascend through it, and then drop down onto the first block to grab the chest, which is pretty clever. Number 87, Mimosic Shrine, Rose Blessing. This is a crystal shrine and when you activate the line from the pedestal, it just goes straight into Death Mountain, so you gotta find a nearby cave, which isn't very hard, especially when you can easily spot the blue pea at night that will lead directly to it. But after that, you need to dig a couple rocks, build a minecart with a fan, which then takes you over to a crystal that's attached to an Igneo Talus. And I'm just gonna applaud the devs here because this is the only elemental talus that's actually very smartly placed. All the caves in the Elden region, which is where this one is, are so hot that you need to have the flame guard effect, otherwise you'll take damage very quickly. But the Igneo Talus is also super hot, and standing on it will damage you even if you have flame guard. So since you're already forced to have that effect, you need to do something else about the Igneo Talus' heat to get on top to damage it. Which you can of course do by chucking cold stuff at it. But they regain their hotness pretty quickly, so even if you do that, you gotta stay on your toes and hop off in time. It makes this pretty much the only Talus fight in the entire game that actually has a monochrome of challenge to it, at least in my opinion. 
After you finally get the crystal, you use the previously made minecart to transport it over some lava, and then the shrine is just a short jog away. Extremely rare mini boss crystal shrine that's actually not bad. Number 86, Gano's Shrine, Rao's Blessing. This is another mini boss crystal shrine, and while I think it isn't as well designed as the previous one, it's a bit more fun, which is of course the most important thing. It's a flux construct battle in low gravity, and there are some fans scattered across the battleground. You obviously don't have to use the fans at all, but flux constructs are designed to be beaten in a lot of different ways, so it would be a waste to not use the unique opportunity given here. The only real purpose the fans can have is sending you upwards when it's in its weird UFO form, which is a pretty fun and unique way of tackling that form. Besides the fans, you can also jump high enough to trigger bullet time whenever you want, which makes the fight very easy if you abuse it, but that's still pretty cool. After the fight, you get to make a pretty basic flying machine with a lot of fans to transport the crystal. Flying around with Zonai vehicles is always fun, especially so in low gravity, so this is a fine shrine. Number 85, Kuma Mine Shrine, Rao's Blessing. This one is almost the same as the last one. It's another Flux Construct battle for a crystal, but this one isn't in low gravity, and you're supplies with springs instead of fans. The lack of low gravity makes this fight more fast-paced, and springs are also a more immediate way of getting high up in the air than fans, especially since you can fuse them to your shield and just shield jump for a quick burst of verticality. A single spring won't launch you high enough to get above the flux construct when it's in its UFO form, so you gotta quickly stack two of them together if you do want to get on top of it with springs, which is pretty fun. After the fight, you need to launch the crystal across a gap to get it to the shrine. Sadly, they provide you with an already built launcher specifically for this, you just need to put it in the right place. I think it would have been more fun if they just gave you the materials to make a launcher instead of a finished one, but I don't think it's a big deal since launching the crystal and then link afterwards with it is still fun in its own right. Number 84, Sifu Meme Shrine, Proving Grounds, Flow. This one is based around a big flowing river with platforms that the construct enemies are on top of. The most notable thing here is that the shrine gives you ice fruits, and if you freeze a construct on one of those moving rafts, they freeze in place but don't travel with the rafts anymore, making them fall into the water and drown. I don't, uh, I don't think that's how physics work. If this is a mistake on a developer's part, I can't believe they would miss that, but I have a personal theory that they did see this and thought it was funny enough to not fix, which would be awesome if true, because it really is funny to see something like this in a game where all the physics usually work 100% how you would expect. Besides that, there are some other interesting ways to defeat the constructs. One is on a raft with two time bombs that will kill it if you activate them. You're given explosive barrels to use, and also fire fruits to burn down the wooden rafts they're on. But that didn't really seem to work. I don't know if you're supposed to burn them like how I tried, but if not, then I don't see why you'd be given fire fruits. Also, it's worth noting that if you don't catch the very first raft at the start, you have to wait quite a bit for another one to come around so you can ride it to get to the center where the materials are, which kind of sucked, but I suppose you could also just swim it and take the hits you'd receive. Number 83, Toki Shrine, Rose Blessing. This one's pretty interesting. It's a crystal in a cave, and upon activating it, a big stone door will open up, revealing a long hallway with rolling boulders you'll have to transport the crystal through. You're also given two wooden planks that you can use, and I tried attaching them to the crystal, so I could make a shield I could stand inside of, but sadly that didn't really work as I couldn't get close enough while ultra-handing the crystal, so I just held forward and hoped for the best, and I somehow just didn't run into any boulders. One of them touched me here, but it didn't really do anything. I feel like the devs anticipated people just walking through here without running into any boulders, so at the end they have a thin hallway with one big boulder that rolls through it, which you can't really dodge. At first I was able to just stop it with the crystal, but it did push me back. In the second attempt it made me drop the crystal and went past me, so I recalled it and then grabbed the crystal to just walk to the end with it, which I feel like is likely what you're supposed to do. Pretty fun shrine, though not very challenging. Wish there were more obstacles and you were also given a bit more tools to work with, instead of just two small planks. Number 82, Sukuku Shrine Spinning Gears. First you see a gear with an orb continuously rolling off it, and it's pretty easy to figure out you're just supposed to recall it. Then you have to turn a cock yourself for a bit in the opposite direction of the finish, so you can recall it to get up to it, which is pretty clever. Almost every shrine that features cocks has to use recall on them at least once, so this shrine really isn't very unique, but spinning a cock yourself with ultra hand physics is pretty unique, so that's a big plus. I also really like the bonus chest. You can notice this grating on the floor with a chest under it, so you gotta spin the cock in the opposite direction you're supposed to, which is the direction you might initially think you have to spin it in. It's almost like a double fake out, if that makes sense. Number 81, Sinakawak Shrine, an uplifting device. This will be one of the first shrines anyone will do. It acts as an introduction to the hot air balloons, so the little showcase of it at the start is really smartly done, and it also just looks kinda funny. 
they give you a couple hot air balloons to work with and a torch, letting the player toy around with the balloons first to get a grasp of how exactly they work. Anyways, you're supposed to make a simple platform under a balloon to go upwards as you'd expect. And after that, you have to hit an upside down button on the ceiling by putting a balloon under it and making it rise, which is already a very unorthodox way of using hot air balloons, so that's pretty cool. For the last part, you have to bring a small orb upwards, and there's even a big orb which you only need for the bonus chest. And you can see that beforehand because you enter this room from the very top, letting you see the goals first. They give you a lot of stuff to work with here, so it doesn't feel like there's an intended solution, which is always great design in my eyes, as that lets players use their imagination more. I chose to just attach the two orbs together, and put one balloon and a flame emitter on it to make them very slowly drift upwards. It might not be the most elegant way to do it, but it was my way, and I liked it. There's also a lip for you to ascend to the top, making it so you don't need to make a balloon for the fourth time just to get up there again, which is smart. Very well designed early game shrine here. Number 80, Geotox Shrine, Rose Blessing. This one is in a cave and super easy to describe. It's a series of minecart tracks you have to ride. You occasionally have to hit switches to change tracks, otherwise you'll do another loop, and eventually you'll make it onto a platform with some enemies for you to defeat, so that you can stand on it, turn the minecart you came with around, to finally reach the end. It's not that deep, but it's pretty fun. The only other thing I can say here is that I got absolutely cooked by a couple of Octroks, which was pretty embarrassing. Number 79, Tsutsum Shrine, The Stakes Guide You. This shrine utilizes stakes, those pillar zona devices that I feel are severely underutilized in the game. First, you have to stick a platform with a stake in a wall moving up and down, so you can ride it to the other side. There's another stake on the opposite side, which I feel like spoils the solution here a bit. I get that it's to show that stakes can stick into walls and such, which this might be the first time any players see that since stakes are so underused, but I feel like a smarter way to subtly show this would have been to have that stake with a platform you have to use first be positioned in the ground when you enter the shrine. Anyways, after that comes the bonus chest for which you kinda just have to stick the same platform into a wall again, but this one isn't moving and you have to ascend to it, making it different enough. The final puzzle is the main one and it's pretty great. You see a big orb that keeps rolling off an edge, so you move the stake under it slightly up so it stops the orb's momentum, letting it fall onto a spinning platform. Then you have to use another stake to stop said platform in a way that lets it roll onto the railing next to it, and then finally you have to put the last stake into the rotating wall behind the rails to give the orb the last push it needs to make it up to the goal. This last puzzle essentially has you build one of those Rube Goldberg machines, which I've always had a huge affinity for, and this shrine would have ranked higher if it wasn't for one unfortunate problem with it. The last stake you have to place can be a bit buggy. The spinning wall behind it is slightly bigger than the shape of the railing the orb is on, so if the stake gets a bit too close to the railing, it will poof out of existence. This happened to me, so I tried it again, not realizing what cost it last time, and it happened again. Newer players might not realize it's because the stake is getting too close to the railing, and think that that's just not the intended solution, and that it disappears only because that's not how the devs intended it, which is a feeling this game should never and does never give you other than maybe this instance. I might be overreacting a bit, but I feel like this could have been easily fixed by having the spinning wall be slightly smaller, so that even if you stick the stake as far on the outside of the ring as possible, it won't collide with the railing while still having it drag the orb which probably wouldn't be too hard to do since the orb is huge. Still though, I like this shrine, I just feel like this little detail could have gotten a bit more attention from the developers. Number 78, Reni's Shrine, Jump the Gaps. Very simple shrine here. It starts with a switch that when hit, will make an orb roll down super fast into a small wall with a hole under it, and you can see a goal across the gap. So you grab a metal plank that's nearby, place it in an extremely obvious spot to create a ramp and hit the switch again, which will make the orb jump from it and land onto the goal. After that you have to do the same thing, but there's no wall, and you also get a square metal plank, so you gotta make the ramp yourself. This is pretty easy to figure out, and you might make the ramp incorrectly one time, but sadly once you get it with the most obvious solution ever, the shrine is over, that's the last puzzle in it. I really like this idea of making launcher ramps, but I wish they made at least one more puzzle here. Like maybe the last one could have given you one metal plank and a bunch of random objects like barrels or some boulders, making it not so obvious how you have to build the ramp. It's a good shrine, just one I wish had a bit more to it. And number 77, Kimayata Shrine, Proven Grounds, Smash. This Proven Grounds is clearly based around smashing pillars to drop stuff from above, which is a fun idea. Sadly, there isn't a weapon or something you can quickly get to actually break those pillars. I noticed some spiky balls on top of a platform held up by pillars you're supposed to smash, so I ended up freezing some enemies, allowing me to run over to it and ascend up to those balls to make a hammer with them. There's a platform with three constructs above some water in the middle, which you're clearly supposed to throw those weapons at to break the pillars and let them drop into the water, which I did go for, but sadly the pillar doesn't break in one hit, 
so I had to get in the water to get my sledge back so I could throw it again, which did end up working as expected and was great. I think you're supposed to freeze enemies under those platforms with the ice fruits the shrine provides so that they're stuck in place for you to break the pillars, but the problem is that those platforms are held up by multiple pillars, so no matter how you do it, one of the pillars is gonna stay intact, which makes the platform fall crooked and not really smash the enemies. It's still a fun enough grooving grounds with a cool idea, I just think it could have been realized better. And hey, that was shrine number 77, meaning we've gone over exactly half the shrines in this game, which also means that this video is now over, because like I said at the start, this ranking is going to be a two-parter. I'm going to keep this ending here short in case you just want to get on with the ranking and start watching the second half, which is not only going to have the remaining 76 shrines obviously, but also some fun details I've learned from making this ranking, such as what percentage of all shrines are blessings, how many crystal shrines there are, how many proven grounds, all that fun stuff, and even how big the file size for this project was, considering I had to record an entire playthrough of this game for it while doing all the shrines. It's pretty big. If part 2 is already out by the time you're watching this, you can click the little pop-up in the top right to go watch it. If not, it'll be out later this month, and you should subscribe if you haven't already, to make sure you don't miss it when it does release. Anyways, I'm gonna do my standard outro now, cause again, I wanna keep this short. Big shoutouts to The Flying Fire, Quote is Cool, Giant Firing Cole, Right the Yoshi, Herc, Lime the Chef, Exo Bear, Sheen for the Win, Sil700, Lurifax1, The Game DD, and the rest of my awesome Patreon supporters. Fun fact, some of the outfits you saw Link wear in this video were decided by my patrons, so if you wanna show off some cool drip in following Zelda videos, you know where to go. Stay tuned to see my thoughts on the 76 best shrines in Tears of the Kingdom. And as always, I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.